network, and we look at this uh, massive housing crisis that is across the country it's in every urban center, basically playing itself out in basically the same way. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that the banks, who um, the most parasitic institutions, basically crashed the entire economy, and yet they got massive bailouts, and really got the anger of everybody um, from that, you know, from the Tea Party to, to the left to the middle. Everybody, everybody is, is just furious about what's going on. So what we're trying to do is to take a, a organized social movement. Our basic principles are housing is a human right. We want to elevate housing to a human right and gain community control over land and housing in the way that Howard's talking about of, of um, really promoting, changing our fundamental relationships to land through community land trusts and other types of institutions where we can decommodify housing and land. And what we do is everything is through direct action. So the, um, one is through um, liberating vacant houses. So we um, identify vacant homes in Rochester where we have a huge homeless population upstate Rust Belt City that's um, been it's basically a permanent recession economy. Um, yeah. Louder? Yeah, louder. a little bit louder. And, and why don't you tell us what you told me yesterday. Um, tell us a little bit of what, what's happening right, right now, especially with one, one case. We actually have a video which we can we can always share them online and sure. uh, after. Sure. So I prefer if, if you can talk about it more yeah. than showing them the video and sure. we can actually show videos some other time. I think. Yes, yes, so just briefly what we do is, is, is so is that we, we move um, families into vacant homes and we've only been around for about eight months but it's really gener generated quite a, a flurry so we've moved in um, um, five or six families into vacant homes you know, we turn on the electricity, um, we turn on um, you know, the heat and basically you know, meet the neighbors very like some people talk about back door squats and open uh, front door squats and it's very open, openly done um, in Rochester, and it's, it's really been successful. Some people have been in their houses for the last eight months um, consistently, um, and so this is when we're trying to build a systematic movement in the way Frank's talking about in New York City, where we really build this network where people can plug into, and, and as we work is on the basis of needs, mostly homeless families, and move them into houses. Now, the other, the other aspect of what we do is um, is eviction defenses and foreclosure defense, which is obviously a massive crisis. We have you know, over a million foreclosures a year. Um, some people estimate just in the last three years, there's been over 10 million people displaced in the United States just to foreclosure, which is more people that are displaced in traditional warfare. You think about the Iraq War. Okay, so we have really this protracted class war that's literally displacing people everywhere, of course, people all across the country. So, so we want to cut off that right as it happens. So um, just in the last month, we've been working on a um, protracted struggle with foreclosure defense where a um, family of 11 being evicted from their home by um, Fannie Mae, um, who took it over from Bank of America, um, and you know, seven kids. Uh, basically, the, um, the father, grandfather, uh, and the husband of the family passed away from cancer. Um, and then Bank of America refused to renegotiate the loan, mm -hmm. and uh, we got in contact with this family, and they said that they wanted, they exhausted all their legal um, opportunities um, and channels, and they said they wanted to fight back. So basically, we organized an eviction watch in the way that um, Frank is talking about, mobilized the community. So when the marshal came to evict the family, um, he backed out. Um, and then they came back the next day. Uh, we had another 50 people there. And, um, and they came with the moving truck, and the moving truck came, and they saw all these people there, and they just parked around the corner. And there was this standoff for about three for about three hours. All the media was there um, with their big cameras. We go up to the moving truck and say, "Do you know anything about this eviction on Nine Raven?" And they say, "Oh, we're just here to meet our we're just here to meet a friend." <laughs> so then they parked the truck up for, for a couple blocks over, and eventually, eventually they left. The media knew what was going on. They saw everything. And, and it held on. And we were actually um, successful in keeping the family in the home for about two and a half weeks. We had a permanent eviction watch from nine to five when, um, when um, eviction could be carried out in, in New York State. And, um, but eventually the city made a calculation. They said they really, really wanted to put their priorities to get this grand, this, at this point, a lot of people had already left the homeless shelters and it's just the grandmother living in their home. So we really want to get this grandmother out of their home. So. 
Um, last week, um, Monday morning, they sent basically at 9 a.m. like a drug raid, 20 police cars who stormed the house into evict the family. Um, and um, and you know, and some people, you know, because you know, to fight back, you know, because basically part of our blockade we had before people were locked down with chains um, for with the regular scheduled times, and they held off. Um, so, so they knew that you know we were put up a resistance, but still they said this is really going to be a priority. So, um, in response, we had five people and some neighbors who who went and blocked the entrance and who were arrested, and a total of seven people were arrested um, that day. And um, what seemed to be a, um, you know it was a gamble on their part ended up being a backfire on the, on the side of the police because it really generated a lot of publicity. I just passed around an article from the Huffington Post and starting to receive some national media attention. Um, and basically, um, the next day, um, um, our Congress people got involved, much to our surprise, a local congressperson and Chuck Schumer, the senator, they said, we're, we're going to try to get this family back in their home. So so the police, which, you know, Rochester and all these budgets have massive um, have massive budget deficits, and they can't afford every time there's an eviction event. They literally bankrupt the city if they sent 20 police out <coughs> for every single eviction, right? And um, there's a little video there. Um, but um, and, um, so basically, the latest with that is, you know, we, we showed that it was successful. This is Catherine here, uh, the grandmother fighting for home to. Um, we showed it successful to stop the eviction, and here's his the action. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah he's getting arrested. Um, <laughs> and, um, and and basically the latest is that you know as of last week, um, Bank of America said they would draw up a new loan for the family. So this is the neighbor from across the street. She came out in her pajamas, and the police arrested her in her pajamas across the sidewalk. And, and basically, she wasn't even trying to do this be just because they're police, and they wanted so much control of the situation, and they lost control. But. Um, but it really, um, it really caused uh, um, a lot of. Um, it's, it's Kathy there. It really caused a lot of blur. You can see all the, all, all the police to get her out. Um, and um, and yeah, so so we think you know it's not over till it's over. We think that actually she'll be going, she'll be going back into her home soon, we'll, to celebrate you know a pretty tangible victory, um, to get these to get these people back in their homes. So that's kind of what we're trying to do is in a systematic way, um, and to. One, move people into homes, and then also defend people who are being kicked out. This is kind of our basic piece there. Okay. That might be a great point to open it up for questions. Um, there's a lot of people here who probably have a lot of different interests in this, and we still have a half an hour left. So um, we've got our five panelists here, <coughs> one over Skype. And um, so, are we talking about squatting? Are we talking about squ squatting or uh, reoccupying uh, uh, foreclosed homes? Either one. Yeah, we're talking about a range of different kinds of occupation tactics, from legal homesteading to reoccupying foreclosed homes to totally illegal squatting. We actually have a question here. Yeah, go ahead. So, direct up in the Bronx, there's an enormous amount of empty, vacant housing right now that's been uh, now left for the city because of arrears and taxes. And this is the same thing that the landlords did back in the 70s. They couldn't make any money off the buildings and they started burning them. This time they just leave them to rot. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of them. And these become like real urban problems because it attracts illicit activity like, uh, well, what they consider illicit activity. So with that said, if there's about a dozen buildings up in the Bronx that you know and that the, the 4-7 really isn't going to bother with a whole lot, how do you choose which building you're going to take? I mean, beyond just infrastructural considerations, like if the roof is there or not. I will direct that question to maybe to Frank. He has been involved um, in that area. Well, I mean, just very, very briefly, uh, the various factors that would come into play. Physical condition of the building. Right. Um, the owner. Um, is the owner vulnerable to uh, political pressure on the street? Uh, is it a if bank? there is no owner, if it's a city, it's been foreclosed okay. on. Okay, it, it's HPD. Mm -hmm. um, really, I mean, it's, it's really a question of the structural integrity of the building. If the building is structurally happening and it's, and, and it's, and these are all city buildings? Yeah, well, 
to all extent, the city may not have claimed a lot of them because HPD hasn't moved on. Okay, them. well, just, just in limbo. Just generally, without belaboring the point, basically the research that's done on the, the potential squattable venue, whatever it is, is key. Early on, you want to know precisely the, the situation with that building before you have the crack, you know, an initial kind of crack team, when I'm playing crack team, go in right. and scope it out. Yeah. Um, so basically you do the research on the building and, and see, you know, it's structurally uh, viable. The, you know, in the early days, Martha can tell you in, in that and some of the other people that were around in those days, you know, you, you develop what we're called squatter lake, so you could walk on joists and, you know, you come into buildings that are abandoned for a lot of years, the roof beam is in the front door. Mm -hmm. You know, they're pretty fucked up. Mm -hmm. So, um, but basically that's what it comes down to, the key thing being who's, who's the owner, what's the situation with the owner, what are the potentials for pressuring the owner as, as you know, that's the target. Um, and then figuring out, you know, the, the ABCs in, in, the, in the immediate, which is a clandestine occupation, I mean, you know, because it's a kind of squatting which I don't, you know, call squatting, which is basically making a political statement. Right. You know, standing there with the bulk of, we are going to squat this unless you give us housing, that kind of thing. Right. No, covert, quiet, the whole thing, 30-day law, you know, I don't want to go into all the details, right. just right. getting start getting some mail there and mm -hmm. so on. But, um, yeah, but basically doing the research on the building. If this is a string of city-owned buildings, I would say that people, we ought to be looking at those buildings. Because yeah. uh, the city, yeah. for obvious reasons, is, uh, is very, you know, targetable and vulnerable to, uh, you know, mass occupations of those kinds of buildings. You know, those are the ones, all the buildings we took on the Lower East Side were city-owned. Yeah. Right. Maybe, if, can people scoot in towards the front just a little bit so people can get in the door? Is there anyone still? And I would just say I think that's a big difference between generally the kinds of vacant housing that's available today and what was available in the 70s and 80s is that the city is really trying now not to take possession yeah, of foreclosed true. homes. Um, and so finding something that's actually owned by the city is much rarer. Um, they tend to be sort of in that limbo and then get transferred immediately to different nonprofits. So um, that limbo stage, I think, is, is interesting. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody wants to maybe ask him. Um, maybe pass it to the folks who just came in. People in, in, in France. Do you want to have maybe bring Alan? There. Yeah, they're there, right? This is France squats. Yeah, this, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Especially in French, would be very good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, somebody wants to bring another something up or? <clears throat> yeah, you can say hi. Here. <laughs> Oh, Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, um, maybe you want to share something. Oh, this is so cool. Um, um, what, 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 what? Maybe you want to react to some of the of the discussion we've been having, or is there anything you want to add, or? So can I do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing is, you know, this information has been blocked for so long uh, by the media. Uh, by uh, it's just you know nothing. You absolutely know nothing. Yeah, this was almost the slogan of uh, uh, you don't know anything. <laughs> um, and it, it's really huge uh, worldwide. Uh, there's a whole variety of cutting uh, activities and occupations. It's, it's about vacant property. Uh, the state, primarily the state, uh, can't uh, uh, deliver. The services it, it is uh, in a way obligated for the common good to deliver, um, and they have empty services, empty spaces. People want to deliver these services, uh, so they do it. Um, yeah, you know the the question of, of housing uh, and the question of political space for action, the question of cultural space for cultural action, they're all entangled. Um, as, as the cities, you know that. The laboring uh, workers of the factory age, the poorest industrial age, they're no longer required. They all have to leave the sense of city, which while we can discern, we know this, this is the historical dynamic of the late 20th century. It's accelerating into our own. There's a lot of space that they just can't figure out yet what to do with, or they don't have the, uh, the means to do it. Uh, you can take it. Mm. It's just that simple. Yes, yeah, Sebastian. You don't know quick, that. A quick comment. We have no model to know example. Uh, 
in the USA.